ears, Evan. Evan, the panel is coming. What? 5 p.m. panel, apparently. Why are you making it all weird, Angelus? Welcome to Sunday morning at TFCon. I hope you all enjoy your not full night's sleep. <laughs> and we have here today with us internet personality Vangelis, or Chris Ho, as I think is his legal name. Vangelis. Apparently. Vangelis. Apparently. Vangelis. Yes. G2 Pat. Did Lee. any of you get a grab bag at the podcast panel? Oh, no. Um, no. I've not found a single person online talking about why did I get this stupid art print in my bag? <laughs> <laughs> and I like it even more. <laughs> People are silently suffering with those things. <laughs> See, I was sitting near enough to you that I saw the secret piece Check. Or whatever it was. So I know what it looks I left, by the way, the destroyed piece number one in the form of ripped up paper and three small paper planes on here for the charity auction panel. I don't know if you actually noticed them sitting I on the table. Totally did not. Yeah, it's fine. I just didn't know what else to do with it. Uh, hey, everybody. It's Sunday morning, and it's time for a panel. So I'm going to get my slideshow going because I just realized I'm on shared monitors today. It's very cool. We're doing a panel called Why Do We Enjoy the Toy for 40 Years? <laughs> well, we got some important preamble. Uh, number one, the presenter is merely a collector. I say this because I'm going to talk a whole lot about, you know, things that people might go like, wow, this, guy, this is going to change my life. And you know what? Epiphanies made are lovely. Um, but this is not a gospel. Anything I'm saying here is kind of just speaking from my own experiences. I said long ago at my very first one, it's me working through my collector midlife crisis, and I still am. And I want to, it turns out sharing that with people tends to make people have a good time too, at least one. Someone comes up every time, and that makes it justifiable to the convention. Uh, we are all malleable entities, right? So anything you see in here, it might not match up with you now. It might have matched up with you before. Maybe you changed. It happens. Um, our habits can change from year to year, day to day, etc. Also, the presenter is an internet entity and thus will plug himself like this. <laughs> this is also part of a series of panels which you can see on a YouTube playlist that is kept up to date at this QR code. <laughs> Not every panel is up there yet. There's still some from the late 2010s I have to dig out of hard drives. So sometimes like a panel from 2018 might just pop up in there, but it's kept in chronological order. Uh, also, the metaphorical 40. I'm going to say 40 a lot, right? That doesn't mean literally 40. And if you're not there yet, or if you haven't had 40 years of experience with collecting or life, uh, it could be 20, it could be 25, it could be 30, it could be 29. Uh, is anyone here 28 years old? Oh no. Well, this is going to help you out a whole lot. Uh, we all know, right, the, 20, the, the thing they don't tell you about at 28. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah you know. Um, so, quote unquote, 40 years of prior panel concepts. As I said, there was a QR code. I've done a lot of these panels um, in this sort of line of thinking. And I'm, not trying, I'm trying to not repeat myself constantly, but some of the concepts that are kind of are the bedrock of these are things like assessing your personal subjective frequencies, the subjective things that you enjoy about your hobby, the things that you um, find joy in that you can like focus in on. Because one thing I like to fight against is the idea of like the objectively proper way to do your hobby, because that, that will not bring happiness. Uh, also, maximizing enjoyment outside of hunting and purchasing highs. The serotonin from looking for a toy, the serotonin from getting a toy, they're fine, but they are incredibly glass ceiling. Uh, and they are also often not someone's personal subjective favorite thing. So one thing we try to find is like how you can enjoy your toy, as one panel was called, beyond the buy. Uh, finding enrichment, personal satisfaction out of your hobby. Once upon a time, there was a panel about how to get rich in five steps through toy collecting. Uh, the, um, the punchline was it was personal enrichment, and people clapped, and I was like, that wasn't actually meant to be moving. <laughs> but this was also like in 2021 or 22, so we were all like, hey, I just want something that feels good. Uh, 
Also, ensuring that your hobby is always in service of you first and foremost. This has become a kind of catchphrase of mine to myself, is that hobbies and things that we find fun, they've got to be in service of us. And obviously with toy collecting, a monetary and physical space oriented hobby, it's really easy to, every now and then, like you'll hear your friends, you'll hear a fellow collector go like, man, I gotta go f deal with friggin' finding this thing. And it's like, that. once you get to that point, it's almost like you gotta pause for a second and go like, is this in service of me? I, I don't mean to keep making eye contact with you. You just happen to be sitting right there. <laughs> I promise I'll look around more. <laughs> look, down into the left is like my natural like tripod position. So I apologize. Um, so there are the, uh, oh yeah, I'm looking at my, my next slide. This thing's showing me my next slide after this one. And I'm not used to that level of service from a computer, and it's screwing me up. <laughs> so, I don't know if you know this, but 40 years is four decades. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. 40 times 365, whatever that is, is approximately how many days is contained therein. So, we're going to talk, so, you know, again, 40, right? But as time goes on, routines can become rigid cycles. Like I was saying with collecting, every time a new wave comes out, time to get those pre-orders in, I gotta get those stupid, I don't even like half this wave, right? Becomes a rigid cycle, that side of collecting. Um, the world your hobby resides within can change. The world can change a lot, wow! Oh boy! Things sure do change. Um, we had a couple of bullets in, uh, in panels from the last couple of years about things like, you know, the global shipping crisis and uh, the ongoing effects of 2020 through now on things like um, mass production industries, plastic industries, toys, board games, etc. Lots of reverberations to come and how having a flexible mindset and also one that's oriented about servicing yourself and knowing what you yourself enjoy, it's the way to navigate through that. You know, if you are stuck in the routine of the constant pre-order, it's it, you all know now it's getting harder, right? Um, also, you can change a lot. Wow! Oh boy! Uh, people change a lot. It's one of the kind of cool things about life, in my opinion. And uh, so, as you know, the world changes around you. So do you. And as a collector, you change. The things you enjoy change. And I have more than once encountered a fellow collector who's like, "I don't understand. I bought every Lego set that came out this year, and yet I don't seem to be as happy as I was when I did that 15 years ago, then 14 years ago." Bah, 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 bah. And it's like, oh, you know, maybe you got got so much Lego that you got an over dose and yet your biology still somehow is subsisting on all of that I think ABS I can't remember what they make it out of um, so you know the passage of time is change and change is important and I mean we're at a Transformers convention so kind of inherent to the whole gimmick anyway as you go through life eventually you know people especially people who have been collecting for let's say roughly rounding up 40 years anyone out there doing that yeah Hey, I'm getting close. Uh-oh. <laughs> As you go through, through especially a hobby life for that long, you kind of become one of two extremes. And we all know these extremes. So I'll just bring up the picture. We all know this one. That's us. So this is basically, <laughs> you doing all right over there? <laughs> This is basically our destiny. We're all gonna become one of these two people. No, it's called two extremes for a reason. There's a large gradient in between them. It's the tiger's nose. <laughs> anyway, this, this is one of my favorite films in the entire world, Survive Style 5 Plus. It's constantly on YouTube for free. It's actually on archive.org because it only came out on DVD once ever in Japan with subtitles. Uh, it's a complicated thing, but these two, this scene, it's the end of the first act, and I always think about this when I think about what I've become. So, let's explore the two known extremes. So first we've got the dad. You know, I can remember the good times. My responsibilities drain me. No MSRP phases my comfortable hobby finances. Just look at that suit. <laughs> That's the guy who goes like, pose plus gal guy gar? Okay, I guess I'll just buy that on Tuesday. <laughs> That's so hard though, to lose myself in what brings me joy. And daylight savings on a TFCon Sunday is simply a tradition. It accommodates our farmers and ensures that we live with respect to the 9 to 5, a doldrum that shapes us into stronger people to lead our successors into prosperity. <laughs> so... 
This is not meant to be the bad end. The sp small spoiler here. Both of these extremes, you don't want to be the extreme here. But uh, my idea was surely, you know, especially if you're, you know, a working adult right now, you've got a nine to five. Maybe you recognize some of this. I've I've known this in some friends of mine where it's like. I can get what I want, but I'm having a lot of trouble enjoying it. And then if you get into a routine, you know, it could be, well, I'm not really having a good time now. Maybe I'll just buy another Pose Plus. Maybe I'll, I'll go chase down a Studio half eye kit. It's no skin off my back right now, but, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like trying to force your early hobby self into a life that isn't accommodating it right now. In, in the, you know, flexibility being that operating word from before. Now, Aoyama the Hypnotist. That's his name. He's in papyrus font. <laughs> I anticipate the next good times. Constant pursuit drains me. No MSRP phase is my assumption that future me will handle it. <laughs> it's so hard to find my way out of my hunger for more. This panel ends at 11 a.m. <laughs> Now, a little bit of bias. I do sort of see myself here a little bit more. That's why he gets the good daylight savings quote. <laughs> but this is the other extreme. Like, this is the one where it's like kind of carooning, you know, into, say, a freelancer life. And freelancer life can often have a lot of, you know, peaks and valleys and valleys and valleys, but what a peak! And then a couple more valleys, and, but oh, dang, this peak's up here! So. This is the version where you don't really have that security, but you have that extra freedom that comes with it. And yet, you know, if you're not flexible enough, you kind of just think about the peaks. And you kind of just try to pretend the valleys are, uh, they ended yesterday. Um, so, when you have two extremes, uh, you want to try to find a balance in between. And that's kind of like the take I have on life in general. But, the balance betwixt. Now, how, when's the last time you heard the word betwixt used in serious conversation? <laughs> right. I would have said about five seconds ago, but that's being very, very generous with the word serious. That doesn't count. Five seconds ago is still technically the present. I checked with a mathematician. <laughs> now, if someone's really confident when they say something, like I checked with a mathematician, and you all just believe it, you gotta think about that for a second. Anyway, the balance in between here, the betwixt, is, uh, and I, I I based this on the common theme between the five bullet points on those two, and then afterwards realized you all probably didn't, didn't commit those to memory immediately. So bear in mind this relates to the bullet points between those two. Um, he's kind of finding the joyful present times. Uh, and this, this goes to another panel I did earlier where um, if, if you're having trouble, for instance, keeping up with pre-orders, or if you have like a bunch of stuff and you're kind of like, dang, like I, I still can't get more stuff, it's like finding uh, your joy with what you have. Uh, if you have not really self-assessed very much what your subjective qualities you enjoy are, it's, it's a good time to do so. If you are looking at things on your shelf and you're like, I don't remember what that does. It's like, hey, maybe spend the day with it or something. This is all like you know, baseline ideas, but it, sometimes it helps for someone just to like say it at a panel. Um, and and this, is, this is very much also uh, how to not fall into like the, the pre-order you know, cycle. Um, I've been trying to avoid that. I've missed a couple figures, and I'm trying just not to care. That'll come up in a bullet point in a second, not this next one. Uh, a hobby should recharge you. Those last two extremes were getting drained in two different ways. And once again, a hobby's got to be in service of you. So a hobby should recharge you. It doesn't have to like really like light you up into being Aoyama the hypnotist, but um, a hobby, your hobby time should like not make you exhausted, especially if you fall more towards the dad in that thing, the man in the suit, where you already are kind of running your batteries down with, you know, the, the routine of your life right now. Messing with your hobbies should be anything but exhausting. It, that should actually be a little more, be a little more recharging um, rather than, like, imagine coming off of like a nine to five at like, uh, you know, an office job. You get home and go like, all right, I got off my job. Now it's time to try to deal with these pre-orders. <laughs> you know, like that, that's uh, that's veins coming out of your forehead. That's years of life in every drop of sweat, kind of thing. Uh, existential. Um, really and truly, let's kick FOMO in the groin. Uh, I think I, I had a whole slide about FOMO once upon a time, but like you know, we're in a, an era with the, with toy collecting right now where uh, pre-orders are hard to keep up with. Uh, we don't actually know everything will end up at Ross. <laughs> Last year might have been a freak occurrence. 
It might have been from a company like a Walmart, for instance, ordering more than they thought they needed, and hey, maybe this year they order less. So uh, with FOMO, that's the fear of missing out, right? Uh, not to get like super deep into it, but in previous panels, um, my way of trying to deal with FOMO, that, and the way people have explained it to me as well, is it's, it's really easy, and trust me, it's really easy to be like, oh damn, I don't have Concept Series Megatron yet, and I actually like his alt modes. That's a joke for the Transformers people. Um, <laughs> I actually do like his alt modes, whatever, fight me. Uh, so, you know, do I get worried, oh, if I missed out on that toy forever? It's kind of like, well, no, probably not. I mean, like, worst case scenario, there were a bunch in the dealer room for lots of money. Um, I didn't buy any of those. But uh, every toy that comes out, barring, you know, a couple exceptions where the die roll is a one, you'll have another chance to get it down the road. And sometimes the separation from it for, say, the year it came out could be enough for you to look at it again, you know, if the opportunity arises and go like, Did I actually, do I actually really want it now, this year, in the year 2028, hypothetically? I'm not saying it's going to take four years for every toy to cycle back around, but eh, who knows. Anyway, let's kick FOMO in the groin. I'm really tired of FOMO. I want to I wanna see it go like, and like fall over. Uh, and embrace satisfaction, embrace stepping into new territory. So this is kind of a double statement. If you're really just down with chasing down every new thing, or if your friend got like a neat thing from a toy line you've never seen before and your reaction is like, it's time to buy the entire toy line my friend got a figure from, um, in an extreme. And maybe like think about embracing like satisfaction a little bit, like satisfaction of what you've got. Satisf if you do pick up something new, like sink your teeth into it, make it like your afternoon, you know, like even if it's like a, even if it's a core class or, a, you know, or a deluxe, crack it open, you know, film it a little bit if you do video things, take some photos if you do photo things, write about it if you do writing things. Humans still do that. <laughs> I have a friend who's a writer even who gets money for it. Whoa. Still can happen. Their job talk about AI all the time to their face, <laughs> kicking things in the groin, you know, on the mind again. Um, but to also, if uh, if you are kind of like set in a bit of a, a bit of a rigid cycle, it's also embrace stepping into new territory. Like, and, and this is where if you're starting to feel maybe burned out, it's a weighted phrase. I just you know, it's not really an easier one. But if you know you're a Transformers fan, and yet it's been like a year since you've been excited by a Transformer. Um, and I, I was saying this on, on my podcast since way back, Transformers uniquely, you can take like a year or three off from it and it's very likely still going to be there if you come back to check in on it. And there's very likely at least a year of Transformers something that you probably haven't experienced yet and you can always, you know, dip out and check that out. Um, stepping into new territory I think is a really important thing and this is where it gets into a little bit of the number 40 thing, you know, the quote unquote big number. Um, as time goes on, I think it is harder for a lot of just human brains to unconsciously want to keep stepping into new territory and, and take risks like that. And I think that it's, it's important if you feel like you haven't really done anything new for a while to like try something new. Um, this is in the context of toy collecting, obviously. Um, and toy collecting is also a safe kind of context to do this in because trying something new is not like I'm going to buy a motorcycle. You know, it's like, I'm going to buy a motorcycle Lego kit. Because <laughs> maybe you don't collect Lego a whole bunch. Or, hey, have you ever built a plastic model? Not since uh, 20 years ago. It's like, hey, try building a plastic model again. They advanced the tech. They still put them on sprues. You still have to build them. So I guess, you know, ceiling on the advanced tech. But it's something. Uh, and, like, who cares what time it is? Who cares if it's a plus one or a minus one or a DST or what? You know? At least we're together in here. Imagine being stuck in line right now. I figured this would go over well, because either you've got a line ahead of you today, or you didn't get in on one of those sold out lines, and maybe this gives you a little bit of what we in Germany call Schadenfreude. <laughs> They're with you all. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Let's get down to the interactive stuff. Don't worry, he's just hypnotizing you. <laughs> so, again to pull from my favorite film, Survive Style 5 Plus. 
What is your function in collecting happily? Uh, this is this is kind of kind of a. It's both a key thought you can think about, but also I just wanted to work Vinnie Jones' role from Survive Style 5 Plus into this. Once again, my favorite film. Uh, it is from the mid-aughts, and boy, is it, it's just a film about how to get through hard times. That's kind of the overall message. I didn't want to, I, there were some screenshots I wanted to put in here, but I don't want to spoil the movie for anyone who might not have seen it. Uh, but this is where we can get into the let's talk part. See, let's talk. It's not, it's not threatening at all. <laughs> so rumor has it there is a Q&A microphone. I wrote this because I actually wasn't entirely sure if it was going to be there. Uh, any thoughts on what we talked about? Uh, any ideas you'd like to add to some of what we talked about? And don't worry if it's like, oh, did it come up in a previous panel? If it did, I'll just say like, yeah, but also you're a badass for bringing it up again. Uh, any questions about these topics, like you know, some of the ideas in those last few panels, or also just yeah, any questions about bigger font, literally anything. I love answering questions. Uh, no, no topic is, uh, is off, unless it's like some kind of real life heavy topic, in which case I'll probably just assume a character at you. Um, also, there's that QR code again. I'll just leave it up there. Uh, and by the way, speaking of like and subscribe, you all should like and subscribe to the TFCon YouTube channel. Now, you all in the audience know that we went through this already, but Evan's not in here right now, I don't think. So, Evan, uh, who's on the AV team, uh, runs the TFCon YouTube channel and puts up lots of clips from a lot of the Q&A panels. Not like this one, but the ones with famous actors and voices of Transformers and other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it has footage dating back like 20 years available to him. So if you ever think of a moment from a TFCon Q&A panel and it's not on YouTube, you could probably leave a comment somewhere going like, hey, do you have a clip of this? Or if the clip's up there, you could watch it like 20 or 40 times all the way through without leaving the window, please. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got someone up at the mic. So hey, what's up? Hello. Um, first off, I gotta say this is some really useful stuff. I'm, t I'm turning 27 in a few oh, I'm so sorry. in a few months, <laughs> in in I uh, rather next month, and I already feel and to be honest, I already feel old, given how given that I'm already objecting to thi to new s that I'm already objecting to new things, <laughs> which um, is kind of like I never like. Like when you get there, you realize it's. <laughs> but this has been really useful. Um, how do you deal with um, seeing like um, lately? I've been trying to take long take breaks from social media because that can kind of some of the things in there can kind of send me the wrong way. How do you deal with it as someone who's a social as an influencer yourself? How do you? Um, kind of deal with viewing social media in such a way that it doesn't negatively impact your enjoyment of stuff. Well, there, it's, uh, I had to develop that skill um, without, I didn't realize I needed to develop it until I noticed, kind of like with collecting, that I was having moments of like, this is supposed to be fun. And like, I'm kind of now feeling like really bad. And when I say supposed to be fun, it was in certain contexts. Every now and then, because I have like a certain amount of platform, I feel that, that you know, Levels of platform come with levels of responsibility. Um, but outside of that, and like when say nothing horrible is happening, um, I, I, I notice that like I, I kind of have to assess like how's my brain feeling while I go through this. So I, I try to, to, I try to you know, get into like other things like, and YouTube is not necessarily like, you know, that's where you go. But I had a really bad um, incident with my brain like last summer when I had an infestation problem. Uh, and it messed with me super bad. And so I went like, what have I never watched? And then I just like went nose deep into chess YouTube for like three days. Hmm. Uh, and because I, I never looked at, I, I just never thought about chess, never looked at chess, and then I was like, I'm just gonna do the um, A little while ago I had, I had a bad brain moment and I watched a 40 minute long video about a potter making a tea kettle. Because mm -hmm. uh, I'd never really checked out how tea kettles are made, so I just thought, sometimes I just think like, what if I, what do I not know whatsoever right now? And then, because it's the platform of the current era, like you can usually go to YouTube and go like, um, person making a tea kettle, for instance, and then find the longest video uh, and and kind of delve into that. Or you can crack open. I mean, this is really getting into like uh, road stuff. You can crack open a book. 
<laughs> but I don't mind. <laughs> uh, it, it also helps to like find ways to communicate with your friends that isn't a social media platform. Uh, it's it, you, you can. Um, also take time with your collection, for instance. Like, basically, if, if you're on social media and it's just feeling raw and bad, um, I, try, I try to like, what can I do that isn't gonna keep me where I can tap back into it easily? Also, I, j I basically ditched Twitter entirely. Thank you, I did too. Um, and uh, I can, I, I mean, I'm not the world's biggest creator, but, and there's, hey, there's a YouTuber panel I'm on, by the way, at like 2 p.m. today, you should all come out to that. Uh, I stopped mentioning videos I make on Twitter, uh, and after like two of them, I noticed that my traffic didn't change. Hmm. So I was like, I guess I'd, uh, I'm not losing anything. <laughs> but yeah, it, you know, you got to try to find like th things that just fully separate you from the moment uh, that you can kind of lose yourself in. That are all ideally also like really calm. Like pottery videos are kind of incredibly chill. Um, also, I know I know what you mean, but don't worry about it. In like another hundred years, you'd be like, man, remember when I was like single digits old? And I thought that was old? And then you like, you know, you take your cyber brain and like stick it into like the jogging body. And Mattel. Because it was in your sleeping there. body. Um, I like altered carbon. And Mattel wasn't trying to, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, flashbacks of, uh, uh, yeah, um, cause yeah, I definitely agree with that. Next time, Mattel time a toy company tries to take something beloved from my childhood and tease us with reviving it only to give us an NFT. I'll remember that. Yeah. And, Cell and erasers, it, anyone? It's, it's, a, it's a personality thing, but like whenever stuff like that happens, I just went like, I'm gonna just make fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> I have an approach, like when I get like, you know, toxics in my live chat or in my comments, my approach is usually, I'm going to gaslight them into an ARG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I see what happens. <laughs> I, I hope I hope that was, I'm, I'm glad that, that stuff like this helped you. But also check out the other panels just in case they're helpful. Thank you. And Mattel had better bring back accelerators properly. No more NFTs. I'm gonna buy it. Don't worry. <laughs> when I get my cyber money brain, <laughs> actually they're probably gonna try to do something called cyber money brain. <laughs> Hello. One question: Cesium salami or beryllium bologna? Um. If I have to pick beryllium bologna because it is using two B's, cesium salami is cheating a little bit because it's a C and an S, and like, I like both, but if you're going to give me alliteration and one of them is using two consonants that are like doing the synonym game, then I'm kind of like, I see what's going, I see what's going on here. Thank you so much. That answers my question. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I'm not that tall. <laughs> Hello. Um, I just wanted to say something on what you said about you know not getting every uh, toy release and all that. Um, <laughs> I'm 21, so a lot of toys I want came out way before I was born. <laughs> um, Knowable. <laughs> nothing I could really do there. Um, but like you said, with this stuff kind of coming back around, um, I went on a trip and I found a shop, middle of nowhere town with like population of 400 people that had like original Takara Japanese Optimus released still in box and nice. like all of these toys still in box for a decent price considering what they're sold for on eBay. Shout out to the surfer shop in uh, <laughs> Washington. Cowabunga. <laughs> That's really cool. And yeah, stuff stuff like that is going to happen. Like we used to live in an era, I don't know where it's, <laughs> we used to live in an era of like uh, I've been going through on streams the news of 2003 on TFW. It was supposed to be 2003 through 2008. It's taken 10 hours of streaming to get halfway through 2003, turns out. But <laughs> That was an era when like reissues were not only new, but in 03 they were rapidly happening. That was when North American reissues had started, and you know we haven't had like ton we we still have reissues happening at Walmart off and on, and because none of us can really see in the future, reissue cycles may happen again. They may even start happening for toys from the aughts. Um, it may not, but that's that's why I always say like stuff will always cycle around again, mm -hmm. and uh, and f you might find a surfer shop that's got like. 
all of Cybertron, you know, in box. Uh, and maybe they're like, oh, I only like G1, so I'm selling it for dirt cheap, but I live in like, you know, the surfer island of nowhere, so no one has bought it yet. And they like, hey, you won. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay, so my question is for the very understanding and very supportive spouses in the room that have partners that have, you know, some of those uh, feelings that you've mentioned on, on your thing. And also, what is the nice way to say, do you really need another version of that Optimus Prime mold without <laughs> hurting their feelings? <laughs> well, dear. <laughs> I made some tea. Why don't you come and sit down for a second? <laughs> Honey, um, I think that in a like in a partnership, this is this has been my belief. Like in a in a, in a partnership, like there's got to be lots of communication. And if you see a hobby starting to hurt your partner in a way, whether it is like they're actively angry about it all the time, they're stressing about it, they don't seem to really be enjoying it. Um, and those are the key things because I think if there's just too much stuff, you will also notice that in someone. Um, they're stressing about where to put things, whatnot. I see a hand going. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it, it, it's, and I'm absolutely not a relationship expert, but uh, I think communication is super important. And um, so if you, know, if you see in your partner they're not enjoying something, that's, that's the conversation to have. If, you're, if your partner is saying things in a way where you're kind of feeling bad, you can go like, I see what you, like, always go with empathy. It's, I see what you mean. Could you, could we talk about it a bit more and like talk about like why, you know, you think it's a problem and do you see, is there something in me you're seeing that's being affected by this? You can, and I think in a partnership, you should also be able to say like, hey, it's <laughs> kind of sucks the way you're asking this. <laughs> I, but, but you got to couch it in like, I get what you mean and I'm willing to talk about it, but like also the way that you're approaching this is making me go like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. I, so I'm a, I'm a recovering Magic the Gathering collector, so I can't empathize oh, with no. the fatigue. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... Why can't you just print them? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your response. <laughs> no problem. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, this, was this a... I guess I am kind of tall. Hey. The, the quote is, you could just dress up like the Transformer, and that just makes everything a little, a little bit more on the level. Hello. So, kind of a two-part question. Grail hunting and buyer's regret. Yeah. Uh, I think grail hunting is awesome. As long, like, grail hunting... It's, it's still got to be, I'll say it again, in service of you. The grail hunt has got to be fun and exciting and an adventure. Uh, it, if it gets into something that makes you constantly just like disappointed and angry, then it's like, this isn't helping. Um, buyer's regret is something you can't really, well, you can plan around it with a lot of time and experience, but buyer's regret, there is a way to kind of take it in a good way. Um, if you are in a position to be able to really quickly offer to sell things to friends or you know peers in the community, uh, buyer's regret can almost be like an escape hatch of like, dang, I had to, I got this commander class. This thing in Canada was like nearly three hundred dollars. No, no, sorry, Titan class, nearly three hundred. Commander class is merely only about one hundred fifty to one hundred eighty dollars in Canada. Still expensive. Um, and then if you come away from it feeling kind of like, ah, I don't, even, I don't even know if I like this. If you're able to kind of like flip that into like, well, since it disappointed me. It dies, and then you like <laughs> you put it into the execution slash the sales pile, and it then turns back into probably not the same money you got, but you know some money. Then you can go like, okay, so you know I lost like forty bucks on that hundred and eighty dollar thing. That was my forty dollar uh oh fee, uh, but then that's forty bucks out, not hundred and eighty bucks out, for instance. And I think with buyer's regret, like if you're able to figure out how to like in your position, wherever you live, in your personal context, sell stuff, even if it's just a couple times a year, if you have a place to put things to sell, it turns buyer's regret into like, opportunity, get rich, it's type a stuff. Good way to look Enriched, at it. with enrichment, get, with enrichment. Um, you decide you don't like it, just banish it to the dead universe. Yeah, and, and then I, I would also say like, in talking with you know, friends and peers in your community, Bring it up, you know, because I just didn't really like this thing. And don't and, and I think an important way to do it is bring it up. I didn't really like this thing. I get why some of y'all might like it, but I'm selling it. Which of you really wanted it? 
But I, I think also with, with Buyer's Regret, like, usually Buyer's Regret comes with something that had a lot of hype behind it. And there is an empathic exercise one can do, if it's fun for you, where you can go like, okay, I didn't like this. A lot of people like this. Now I'm going to just academically explore this as a hobbyist and go like, okay, so like, you know, I'm going to look at what people really like. I'm going to explore that. And then at the very least, it might be like, oh, I see how people liked it, and maybe this can inform my own subjective frequencies of like, oh, when people say this, maybe it doesn't mean the same when they say it, but I'm experiencing it. You know, like people are like, oh, it's superposable, and you're like, yeah, but the joints are super floppy. You know, it it, it can all lead into like a whole like Yggdrasil tree of, of possibilities of self-discovery. Yeah, because like not every toy that like you love is going to be something that. Everyone loves super like, important. I love a lot of stuff that everyone hates. Yeah, no, me too. I love the reveal of shield junkions, and I know there's a bunch yes. of us. There's a bunch of us, but there's a lot who don't, and it's good because we get them for like ten bucks loose now. <laughs> it's like you so, don't want them, give them to me. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> but yeah, there, that, that's a, there's actually a lot of stuff in the past panels about uh, about that, about how like. It's, it's a common thing, uh, at least like some years ago, when you don't like a figure, you've also got to figure out why it's bad for everyone. Or, if you, or even worse, if you can't get at a figure, you've got to figure out why it's bad so you don't want it anyway. You know? <laughs> if anything, like, it just makes me love it more, usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you, just positive mindset in a hobby. A hobby is kind of a place for a little bit more positive, maybe a little bit forceful positivity at times, because it's got to be in service of you, you know? So if something really bad happens, you guys got to figure out, like, what's the silver lining here? As long as it's just the purchase of a product, the silver lining is probably there in some way. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. All right. Hello. Hi. Um, so my, qu my question's about um, FOMO, and not necessarily the FOMO of, uh, like, obtaining the toy, but like uh, the cultural conversation that goes with collecting or like other stuff like video games or something like, oh, this new game came out. I don't know if I really want to play it right now, but like all my friends are playing it. Um, oh, yeah, that's or with the, toys and the time anything. ghost. Yeah, the, the zeitgeist, the time yeah. ghost. <laughs> Um, so, like, how do you personally deal with that kind of thing? So, as someone who was podcasting since 08, and who used to, like, really want to keep up with the news on a podcast, and on our podcast, we constantly, at least a couple times a year, bring up the old feeling we used to have of, like, we used to have a segment called What We Got This Week. And it meant that a lot of us kept every now and then going, like, I didn't buy anything this week. I have to get something for the podcast! <laughs> and it was very silly. Um, so, what, actually, video games is a great example. So, video games are a personal experience. There often is a narrative involved. Um, there's often a sense of spoilers involved. So, for video games, I think that the zeitgeist is actually, at times, even a little bit more intense. You know, um, a lot of people would like to be a streamer, for instance. Uh, and my understanding is, like, with streaming, there's a super zeitgeist on any game that comes out. Of like, if you're not playing it week one, yeah, might as well not be playing it. And Small shout out, there is a creator, I would say one of my YouTube OSHIs is uh, John Wolf, uh, who has, I've really, in hey, I've really enjoyed how John Wolf, as a video games oriented creator for a while, has actively and vocally kind of tried to break a lot of those cycles um, and, and go like on my main channel, I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to keep gaming on this other channel and I'm going to game what I want and I'm going to base it on me having fun posting it here. Um, so with, with toy collecting zeitgeist, granted with Transformers, there is an element of spoilers if you like to be surprised by the process, but they're physical objects, there are usually a lot of them coming out at the same time, and what I, what I tried to do was, was see it as anything I don't pick up, I will know someone who picked it up and I can have fun poking their brain about it. And uh, what, going back to that last question, figuring out how to converse about a toy that you have, that I don't have, that isn't bulked and, and, and built around the idea of how do I get it if you like it. But instead it's like, hey, you picked that thing up. I was interested to know what it's like. You know, how's this part work? If you have any genuine questions about it, like, how does the foot flip out, you know? Um, and, and make it into like an active conversation, because for your friend you're talking to, that also creates an enrichment moment for a thing they already bought, because now someone's asking them questions about it. And they get to do basically the reviewer thing, just in conversation, of like, oh, I could, yeah, this part's really cool, I really like this bit, this bit I'm not so into. And then 
you're, you're creating like a fun conversation out of it without having purchased the thing, you're still kind of participating in the time ghost of the object. And in a very like bottom level, you're getting feedback so you know whether or not you actually want it later on. Um, so yeah, purchasing to take part in the conversation, it's a really easy, uh, I think the, the word is a great one, cultural trap for a, a collecting hobby uh, community. And figuring out how to converse about what everyone has as opposed to what we each individually have is one way to kind of like get out of that and also create other enriching habits along the way. Thank you. No worries. Hello. Uh, first off, I just want to say I love your shirt. The Thank spring. you. <laughs> I'm feeling real. <laughs> spring. <laughs> and uh, my question is, it's pretty simple. Uh, just what are some of your favorite releases from this year, whether it be official or third party? Um, so especially in the, in the first like, half of the year, I always have trouble remembering if it's something that came out last year that I only got this year. <laughs> um, so super off the top of my head, um, I'm really jazzed about um, Legacy United Windblade for very, uh, you know, reasons of I think it's a cool toy, but also because I spent literally two plus years constantly shouting on social media. It's super funny how we have another wave of Cyberverse Deluxes. That's so cool. I can't wait to see Windblade, main character of the first two thirds of the show, get a deluxe toy. Oh, look, it's Prowl. <laughs> oh. So that one's really been doing it for me. Um, just uh, also, I like the figure, and I, I, I like a wind blade that is just like fun to mess with because like so many wind blades carry like weird baggage. Like the original one has a stiletto heel foot design. I don't like that on toys. It's like one of my biggest like really personal subjective. Like I just don't like this when a figure has like such a thin standing base. Um, and also on an aesthetic level on, on, on the transformer, I'm just like. It's not as interesting because I can see how it's going to happen, and it's not much to fold away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Wait, are you from the Trans and Science broadcast? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I know I could just talk to you normally, but I figured why not? No, it's more know, fun this way. Yeah. Legit. <laughs> Because then we but, can do the whole thing where I'm like, hey, I'm actually a big fan of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I just wanted to co-sign on uh, everything you're saying here because one of the things I've realized is that uh, you can acquire lots of things, but the one thing you can't acquire is time. And so you need to make the most out of the time you have and maximize joy and don't like intentionally cause yourself pain. So I know personally I'm collecting toys, playing video games, watching movies, watching TV shows, all those things and it got to the point where I felt like it was, you know, it was like another job where you know, you got to keep up with it and got to watch everything, got to, you know, finish every game and it's like, yeah, you know, those humble bundles are really uh, enticing, you know, $10 for 20 games. Yeah, great. Uh, each game, you know, takes 20 hours to complete. I'll be dead before I play all the humble bundle, <laughs> bundles I, I picked up. But, or, and I got all the toy, uh, lots of Transformers I haven't opened yet. So I had to just, you know, change my mindset and say, I'm just going to, whatever I have, I'm just going to enjoy it. If I open it, I, I do. If I play the game, I do. If I don't, it's yeah. okay. Let it go. Don't have to watch every show. Don't have to watch every movie. It's if, fine. If, it, if it's in your personality type, it's kind of how I approach a lot of media now, like with the in-service of you, you know, bracket, mm -hmm. is like, I just walk in and watch the thing, and I try not to plan too much, uh, and I just kind of make it organic. Like, there's shows I want to watch, but I just don't really feel like it. And then when my friend's like, have you seen this yet? I'm like, no, I, have, I, I don't really feel like it yet. <laughs> and then they go like, oh, do you think it's bad? I'm like, no, I, I just don't really feel like it yet. <laughs> And it, it took a while for me to figure out how to like just say that as a response to like something that could well be really good. Is I'm just, I'm not in the mood yet, and I don't want to watch it if I'm not in the mood because then I might not like it for silly reasons, you know. Yeah. Um, but also, we can acquire time. You just have to be able to see the seventh shape of the timelines. It's going back to another panel <laughs> that we did before. That's a throwback. The QR code's right there. Uh, I'll check on that. <laughs> ask Jeremy about this, this, the seven shapes of time. He knows. We have uh, about six to eight minutes remaining, so uh, I'll, I'll speed through here. Good morning. Hopefully this is a quick question. Do you have any favorite jobber or loser characters? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, 
I was about to say G-axis and Tarn, but that's headcanon. Um, yeah, I mean, like, oh boy, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure. Like, when I think about loser, loser characters, because whenever I like a loser character, I start seeing how they're actually the winner. Uh, yeah, I can't think of one now. I guess, like, pardon? Beachcomber. Beachcomber. Yeah, you know, animated Beachcomber is a really cool and, and, and threaded character with lots of layers. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward, I didn't catch that panel last night, but I'm looking forward to seeing what Kean did to like flesh out the canon of that fantastic, I gotta think about this one some more. Um, poke me about this later. Okay, sure. Uh, minus thrust, if you're wondering. Alrighty. Thrust? Armada thrust? Beast, man, not beast machines. Oh, beast machines thrust. Both good jobbers, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Hi, I just wanted to ask, is there a character that you like that other people hate, if not the other way around? Um, well, there is always my fave, but this is more that people have a polite ambivalence about my favorite Action Master Elite. Um, actually, like a lot of IDW's second continuity is the first thing that jumps to mind, because I liked a lot of it, and a lot of people's criticisms while it was coming out were completely valid, but also I really liked it. Um, so it's less about a character and more about like an entire story um, delivery, because mm -hmm. it's like the pacing wasn't great, but also they slowed down for world building that was absolutely on my mental frequency. Uh, and I like I like IDW two Megatron a lot because uh, he's just a a dingus politician who hired a bunch of war criminals and thought he was smarter than them. Might be one of my answers. Also one of my answers I just realized Mega Hex from uh, one Common Rider movie. It's one of my favorite losers ever. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of IDW2 kind of falls into that for me. Mm. Okay, thank you. No problem. We have two more and then we got to call it there. So, uh, why are you dressed in Insecticon colors? Is there something you're not telling us? Yeah, I lo uh, you come, come closer. <laughs> I love the taste. Of brains, 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 brains. S speaking of, oh, it's, I like the IDW2 Insecticons a lot. They were really good. Like, robot body horror is so cool. You know that scene when, like, he friggin' uses a cerebro shell to make the guy kneel down and be quiet while his, his uh, skull cap is opened and he starts eating his robot brains? Um, go read IDW2, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I love eating. Never Angelus, eat please do not eat our attendees. <laughs> I've never in my life eaten an attendee this year. <laughs> All right. I got a quick question for you, sir. Uh, what's your Transformers guilty pleasure? Um, oh boy, uh, IDW2. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, really, a lot of it's like headcanon. Um, also, for a while, it was mostly to irritate friends of mine, intensely cherry-picking the first year of Kiss Play uh, to, to talk it up as a massive sci-fi epic. <laughs> because if you cherry-pick the first year of Kiss Play, it does provide a lot of really cool bullet points if you never mention a lot of other bullet points. <laughs> And then if, say, someone doesn't know what Kiss Play is and they ask you and not your friend next to you and you just start explaining those bullet points and your friend next to you goes like, you, you're not talking about, you're like, what, what am I not talking about? <laughs> Welcome to my ARG. <laughs> uh, but those would be two of mine. Yeah, two. Cool. All right, it's probably our last one. All right, just really quick question. Um, favorite crossover toy, any brand? Oh, um, a lot of the Transformers collabs, actually. I, I don't have all of them because like, a lot of the ones I wanted were also way more expensive than I wanted to pay. But Transformers Collaborative, outside of the G.I. Joe ones, would feel like their own thing. Um, it's, again, headcanon, but like, you put a bunch of them together and you just see a story starting to happen of this weird science team of like Gigawatt and Ectotron as like the, the scientists and you got like Maverick as the himbo secretary <laughs> and then you got like Draculus and Frankentron as like the villains, right? And, and then you got like the Jurassic Park ones as this whole like second plot line for the second season and like just all this stuff in collaborative where I'm like, this is so fun, they could never legally make the cartoon I want out of this because it would cost a million dollars for every still, but that's kind of, I, I really like the, the crossover stuff. Objectively as figures, I think Gigawatt and Ectotron are probably the ones that are the strongest, but a cheap Maverick is really fun. Mm -hmm. If you can get one for like 20 bucks. I agree, yeah, I have two. Anyway, thank you all for coming out to this panel, and Woo! once again...
Once, once again, justifying this time slot, ideally, to TFCon, because we occupied it and had fun. Uh, if you did like this, a little, little selfish thing, mention it at the organizer Q&A if you're there, that you enjoyed this, and if you saw any other, other ones, other fan panels. Little, little thing I might want to throw in here. I want more fan panels. I love fan-submitted panels, and there aren't a ton. Um, like, if you have an idea for a panel, uh, the worst thing that'll happen is they might go like, oh, we don't have room for it. But I've also never heard of that happening yet, so you could be the first. <laughs> so it's like, come up with some panel ideas, because this is like, the, the, the guest Q&As are a huge part of a convention, right? But equally as much are things like this, or like, did you, anyone see Kian's panel yesterday with the, the animated yeah. deleted scenes? Yeah. Um, that one was like 50% a guest panel, but... It's, it's still an easy one to pick. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks for coming out. And uh, speaking of guest panels, there are more happening in here. And as a fully selfish plug, 2 p.m., definitely be here. We have the Transforming Media panel with a bunch of other media makers. And it's going to be extremely Q&A oriented. We don't have giveaway bags, but I can give away my heart to you. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thank you, Evangelist.